Matthew chapter 6 is where we are. Matthew chapter 6. If you have your Bible or Bible type device, turn there. And we've uh, had a little bit of a break from our Sermon on the Mount series. We've been going through the book of Matthew in order, verse by verse. And we've been on the Sermon on the Mount for a little bit now. It's 5, 6, and 7 in the book of Matthew. Had a couple week Palm Sunday and then Easter Sunday we were off, but we're back on uh, the Sermon on the Mount. And, and remember, I'll remind you, so, the longest recorded sermon of Jesus, and it's recorded for us here in the book of, of Matthew. Now, I'll remind you too, chapter 5, talks, Jesus talked about uh, bad things, things like lying, murder, adultery, these kind of things. And his point was, these things, although they're bad when you, when you actually commit those things, they're actually a matter of the heart. So even when in your heart you commit these acts, lusting after someone who's not your wife or, or hating someone to a certain extent, he said that you're guilty of these crimes, these sins of murder and adultery and, and even fraudulent oath giving. They're all a matter of the heart. Well, chapter 6 takes a little bit of a turn, but in the same theme, he says even good things. And there's three here, like um, giving, praying, fasting, all these things too, even good things are a matter of the heart. And it's not just your actions that matter. It's the motive behind your actions that really are what matter. So let me read that for you. It's just four verses this morning in chapter uh, 6, Matthew chapter 6, verse 1. Uh, just four. It should be pretty quick. We should have you out by 1.30 at the latest. Here's what it says in chapter 6, verse 1. Be careful not to practice your righteousness in front of others to be seen by them. Otherwise, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So whenever you give to the poor, don't sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets to be applauded by people. Truly, I tell you, they have their reward. But when you give to the poor, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving may be in secret. And your Father who sees in secret will reward you. So he says, first of all, be careful not to practice your righteousness or do righteous or charitable or good deeds or good acts in front of others. Be careful about your practice of righteousness. Now, um, you think, what are, our, what are our practice of righteousness? Well, giving is one example here that's mentioned, but, but really that's kind of a broad category. And I would submit to you this morning that if you've been saved by Jesus, he's come into your heart and changed your heart and your life, then your life should produce righteous acts. Don't you think? I mean, that's just logical. So let me ask you this morning, what are your righteous acts in your life? What are the righteous acts that your life is producing because you've been changed by Jesus? And I'll just throw it out there. If church attendance is the only one, that's probably not good. That's probably not good. But, but if we've been changed by Jesus, our life should produce righteous acts, good deeds, charitable things, things that, that God has done in, in us and out of us. And he says, be careful when you do these things. Don't do them in front of others just to be, be seen, to be seen. There is a Greek word, theomai, theomai, uh, which is where we get our English word theater. Theater, theomai, to be seen. He says, don't, don't do these things as a performance just so other people can, can watch you and see what you're doing. And, it, and it's, really the, it's really the motive, isn't it? And that what we're talking about, it's the motive behind our actions which matters. So a person who does a good thing just to be seen, just to be patted on the back, appreciated by others, doesn't do it because they have a love for that individual they're serving. They don't do it just because they have a love for God. They want to worship God through their actions. They do it so that others will see it and applaud them, appreciate them. To be seen like a performance would be seen. Now, here's the test. Have you ever done something good, done something charitable, and you were just dying to tell somebody about it? And you just really hoped somebody would notice? Or you knew somebody knew about it and you got mad or at least upset a little bit in your heart that they didn't pat you on the back or tell you good job. If you've ever found yourself in that situation, you can be sure that at least part of your motives there were to be seen. 
You didn't do it just to, to serve God or to serve others, but you might have done it just to be seen. Now, in chapter 5, verse 16, some of you are sharp, so I better cover this or you'll catch me on it. Send me all kind of nasty emails. I'm just kidding. Y'all don't do that. I'm just kidding. It says this in, in chapter 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to God, uh, to your Father in heaven. He said, doesn't it say to do good in front of others in chapter 5? In chapter 6, it says, don't do that? Well, no, it's no contradiction. See, chapter 5 says, so that they may see your good works and do what? Give glory to who? Not to you, to your Father who is in heaven. So it's, not, it's no contradiction. And here's what's true. Sometimes, in order to do good, you have to do good in front of people. Like, I'll give you an example. Like, if you, if you are on your way out to the parking lot this afternoon and you see, you know, somebody who's uh, having a difficult time, maybe on a walker or a wheelchair or something, fall over in the parking lot, but there's a lot of people around, sorry, can't help you, ma'am. You're going to have to figure it out, <laughs> you know, or, or wait till everybody leaves, and then I'll come help you. But there's too many people around, and the pastor just said, you can't do good in front of others or it doesn't count. Well, that would be wrong, right? <laughs> that would be sinful. Sometimes you, you, in order to do good, you, you have to do good in front of others. And I would tell you, like, you know, for example, like, look what I do. You know, I'm a preacher. So I guess me preaching on a Sunday morning is one of my good deeds or righteous acts. But there's no way for me to do that and not do it in front of people. That's kind of the point, right? Sometimes to serve, you have to serve in front of others. The issue is your motivation. And I'll tell you this, friends, and you know this is true. It's really hard to, to do a righteous act, to do good in front of others and not think about what they're thinking about. You know, it's really hard to do it with the right motives. So let our light shine, but the, the, the idea is that, that our, the glory should not go to us. It should go to our Father in heaven. But yeah, I'll point this out. You know, uh, he, the, the issue here is righteous acts, as I mentioned, charitable acts or righteous acts, good deeds. But then twice here it says, whenever you give or when you give to the poor. Twice it mentions giving to the poor. So that's probably just an example of a righteous act. But it's an example Jesus uses twice in four verses. So, so that's, that's interesting, and that's probably significant, don't you think? And here's the truth about Christians. Christians are generous. It doesn't say, if you give to the poor, does it? Twice it says, when you give to the poor. So there's an expectation of giving, specifically giving to the poor. I heard about a a young boy who after a service on Sunday morning walked up to the preacher at the back door and handed him $2. The pastor said, so, 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 no, 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 you're supposed to put that in the offering plate as it goes by. He says, no, 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 this is for you. And so, well, that's awfully nice, but why would you give me $2? And the little boy said, because my dad says, you're the poorest preacher we've ever had. <laughs> and so giving, giving to the poor. It's just an example here of giving, giving to the poor, though. You think about in Jesus' time specifically, they lived in a time where people lived in, in pretty much po poverty. They were peasants for the most part. They were day laborers and farmers, and they, that was dependent on work availability. And if it rained, if it didn't rain, and there was no social services at all, no welfare, any way to take care of a person who wasn't able to take care of themselves. So people were dependent on the charity of others in order to survive. So I think the idea here is that, that we should be generous to people in need. Now, I always like to caution you here a little bit. We now live in a society with uh, drug and alcohol abuse that seems to be running rampant. And so I would always say, be careful how you help people. If you really want to help people, a lot of times money is not the best way to help people. You know, maybe give to the poor, but maybe give them a meal, right? Go buy them something. Maybe help them. We probably get calls, man, I don't know, probably a half a dozen a week calls here at the church, people asking for money specifically. They want money. And, and oftentimes we try to, we'll, we'll try to help them in another way. Instead of just handing out money, that's not very good stewardship of God's money. And it's interesting how people often really aren't interested in those other kinds of help. So maybe tells you their mother, what do they really need? Maybe they need help getting into rehab. Maybe they need help, you know, getting into sta a stable job or stable housing. Like we should be trying to really help people, not just hand them money. So, so don't make yourself feel better by handing a couple of bucks out the window to a panhandler 
and feel, but make sure you're really helping people. That should be our goal, to really help those in need, really help the poor. Now, I'll say this, though. Uh, I, I have found in my time here in Cushing that Cushing, Oklahoma, is a very generous community. That's what I found. When a need arises, typically, by the time you try to jump in to meet that need, three or four other groups or people are ahead of you. And you can't even get there in time to help. It's a very generous place. And also, First Baptist Church, by the way, is a very generous church. That's been my, exp- my experience here. And you think about even just this building you're in right now. Uh, this last week marked three years in this facility. Isn't that incredible? And so I need to bring it up every once in a while to remind you what, what an incredible thing that was that God did, uh, the fact that we built this facility debt-free because of the generous giving of many of you and many that have gone on to be with Jesus already who gave knowing that they would never even sit in these chairs. But their motivation wasn't their own comfort and enjoyment, but that next generation of believers here in Cushing, Oklahoma. It's incredible. 16 years they were giving to make this a reality. They started giving when I was in high school. And then I got to be here at the end to see the fruit. And and, and you guys are enjoying it here today as well because it's the generosity of believers. I want to point that out. So he says, when you give, though, don't be like the hypocrites. Don't you hate that word? If you're a Christian, don't you hate that word hypocrite? Man, you want to make a Christian mad? Call him a hypocrite. That's, that's the number one surefire way to do it. He says, don't do it like the hypocrites. Here's what the hypocrites do. He says, don't, when you give to the poor, uh, don't sound a trumpet before you like the hypocrites do. Did they really do that? Can you, can you imagine? We're going to go give some money to the church. We need to hire a band. You know, like <laughs> Get the trumpet going. Everybody pay attention. We're putting some money in the offering plate. Isn't that so silly to think about blowing a trumpet before you give? Gosh, we would never do that today. Today we just put it on social media. Am I right? So blessed to be able to help these people today. Hashtag blessed, right? Why do we do that? We want people to think a certain way about us? Do we want people to think that we're a certain kind of person? Is our goal that they would glorify God when they see that action? Is our goal that they would glorify us? That's the issue. I heard about um, a guy who went to a job interview at a zoo, you know, and uh, he got there not knowing what to expect at the zoo, and he gets there, and they, they, they tell him, listen, the gorilla died, and we're going to need you to wear this gorilla costume. People love the gorilla. They won't come if the gorilla's not here. Just, you know, play around. That's all you got to do. Wear the gorilla costume all day. Play around the exhibit, and uh, then, then you're good. You're good at the end of the day. So he thought, that's a pretty easy job. He put the gorilla costume on and was swinging around. Got a little too fired up. You know what I mean? Got a little too into it and accidentally swung over into the next exhibit which was the lion. He's in a dilemma there, you know. He thinks to himself, if I scream for help, they'll know I'm in a costume, I'll lose my job. If I don't, I'll probably get eaten by this lion, you know, attacked by this lion. So the lion roars really loud, and this man lets out a big scream from inside that gorilla costume. And then the lion makes its way quickly towards the gorilla, the man in the gorilla costume, And then the lion whispers, hey, if you don't shut up, you're going to get us both fired. (laughs) But but that's what a hypocrite is. Actually, the word uh, hypocritos in the Greek means literally to wear a mask. To wear a mask. You know what a hypocrite does? They look one way on the outside, but on the inside, they're different. I heard a story about the, the, it's it's true, the Queen Mary was the largest ship to ever cross the ocean when it was built in 1936. It was on the ocean for 40 years, even through World War II. When they decommissioned the Queen Mary, they made it a museum and hotel in Long Beach, California. And in the process of converting it, they had to remove the big smokestacks, three big smokestacks off the top. And when they moved these smokestacks and they laid them down on the dock, they just crumbled 
which was perplexing because they were made out of three-quarter steel plate when they were constructed. Upon further investigation, they realized that all the steel had rusted out. And the only thing that was holding those big smokestacks together was about 30 coats of paint that had been applied throughout the years. See, well, they had the, ex- the external appearance of strength, but this is what Jesus meant when he called the Pharisees and the Sadducees whitewashed tombs. You look at it on the outside, but inside there's no structure. There's nothing really holding you together. It's just external appearance, and that is exactly what a hypocrite is. Someone who looks one way on the outside, but on the inside is different. And when we serve, just to be seen by others, we are being hypocritical. And and I don't always think it's fair, but you know as well as I know, the number one criticism of Christians is what? Hey, how come you don't go to church? How come you don't uh, believe in God? How come Because of those hypocrites down there at that church. How many times have you heard that? Because I've heard it about a million. Now, like I said, I don't think that's always a, a fair assessment. But that's what they say, isn't it? So Jesus says we should avoid this uh, service just to be seen. And he says that this way, when they do it just to be uh, applauded by people. So first of all, he said they do it to be seen and they do it to be applauded. Now, I want to caution us. Don't think that it's wrong to applaud people. When you see somebody serving God or doing good, righteous acts, I think it's good to pat them on the back, to encourage them in their righteous acts. I think that's a good thing. The Bible would commend you encouraging people. And I would further say this, you know, um, it's easy to applaud the people on stage, right? Because it's visibility. Why don't you applaud people, especially around your church, who you see serving that probably don't get the applause? Why don't you keep an eye out for those kind of people who exemplify this service not to be seen and pat those guys and gals on the back? So it's good to applaud. Don't think you can't applaud people. The Bible says give honor where honor is due. Really, the the prohibition is against serving to be applauded. And I'll tell you this, applause, the applause of man is a frivolous thing. Isn't that true? The people who, who will clap for you today will cancel you tomorrow. People who pat you on the back today will stick a knife in it tomorrow. I mean, think about even as we thought about the Passion Week last week with Jesus. He makes that triumphal entry at the beginning of the week, and they're saying, Hosanna, Hosanna. They're, they're waving palm branches. They're putting their coats down so a donkey could walk across them, okay? That's, wow. And at the end of the week, what are they crying? Crucify him, crucify him. It's not a new thing. The applause of men is frivolous. It doesn't last long. Why would you want something so frivolous? And when we take this applause, the applause of men, what we're guilty of is stealing the glory that belongs only to God. It's God's glory. It's God's honor, not ours. We should be living for his glory. Our righteous acts should point to him, not point to us. Only God deserves it. So let me ask you this question. If you had an employee working for you and you knew he was stealing Would you give them a raise? Would you reward somebody you knew who was stealing from you? So why would we expect God to reward us for things when we're stealing the glory that belongs only to him? And that's what it says next. It says when you do this, you have no reward from your Father in heaven. So if you get the applause from people, that's all you get. If you do it for the applause of people, you can't collect the applause of people and pat yourself on the back and feel real good and go, oh, and also God's now going to bless me. No, God says no. If you do it for the applause, applause will all, is all you get. But when you do it for him, he will reward you. He'll reward you. But first he says this, and this is interesting too. Um, don't let you, verse 3, don't let your, your, your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Don't let your left hand know what your right hand, when you give, don't let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. Now, in order to do that, literally, you have to have a pretty severe brain injury, okay? So you can't, you can't actually do that, right? Like, it's impossible not to communicate between your hands. So what's the point here? I think the point here is that not only will we tend to do things to be applauded by others, oftentimes we'll do things to be applauded by ourselves, 
Hide your good deeds even from yourself so that way you're not tempted to pat yourself on the back. Do things for the right reason. I mean, you might keep it from others and then go home and real feel, oh, man, look at me. Look how awesome I am. The goal should be glorifying God. And when we do that, he'll reward us. Now, let me put a couple limits on something here, and then I'll talk about uh, how God rewards us. First of all, I've heard two errors, maybe, I think, or over-applications of this passage in the Bible, uh, in the church, excuse me, over-applications of this in churches. So I know a guy, this is not a made-up, you know, some of these these preacher stories you never know, but I know an actual physical guy who doesn't ever write a check when he's given his tithe and put it in the offering plate. He only puts cash in the offering plate because he doesn't want anybody to know how much he's given. And he would point to this verse. He doesn't want the giving record at the end of the year. He wants none of that. I think that's an over-application. Here's why. If you put money in an offering plate here at this church, I don't know about every church, but I can tell you about this church, um, whoever is the, uh, there's a small group of people who count the offering every week, and those rotate, okay? And then, and then we have our financial secretary, and, and she knows but other than that, nobody else knows how much you give, ever. Not me, certainly not me. Uh, that's intentional. And so I don't think you have to worry about, maybe, unless your motivation is, boy, I really want to impress those couple of money counters. And our, boy, Donna, our financial secretary, I want her to think, man, I'm awesome, you know, I'm a big giver. Unless you're trying to impress Donna, then I think, I think you're okay. And also that giving record, sometimes I know they, the tax things always change throughout the year, and maybe you, you don't give enough to get, get on your taxes or whatever. I don't know, but um, I, I know people felt bad about that. Well, I don't want to get a refund on my taxes because of my giving to the Lord. Here's what I say. Give the refund to the Lord. Amen? Spoken like a true preacher, right? Give more. Yeah, we'll take it. Right, but if that's your hesitation, don't let Uncle Sam keep it. He's not going to do good things with it. Take that refund and give it to the church or give it to another charitable organization or help somebody else with it. That's one. Here's another one. I know churches that don't pass an offering plate, they have a box on the walls in the back. Have you seen that? And sometimes they point to this verse. So that way the giving can be done in secret. And I say, but what if somebody watches another person put money in the box? I mean, come on. It's no different. It's the same. You know, you can watch somebody put money in the plate. It's easy. You can put it in the box in the back. Sometimes over application of these, I think the motive is the issue here. That's the thing. And so, I don't want to skip this part. This is the good part here. It says that, so that your giving may be in secret, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. Your father who sees what's done in secret will reward you. Here's good news God knows what you do, God knows about your giving. And not only that, God knows about your heart, He knows the heart with which you give. He sees all those things. He knows your motivation. He knows why you're really doing it. And he says that he will reward you. He'll reward you. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 6 says this. Now without faith it is impossible to please God, since the one who draws near to God must do two things, it says. He must believe that God really exists. That's a priority for faith, right? But here's the second thing it says. And believe that he rewards those who seek him. Isn't that interesting? He rewards those who seek him. God rewards. Now, what kind of rewards are we talking about, Pastor? Here's the truth. I don't know. Are we talking about earthly rewards or heavenly rewards? Well, I don't know. The applause of man is an earthly thing, so maybe we're talking about earthly rewards. Bible also talks about uh, rewards. I believe we'll get in heaven. Some people don't believe that, but I think we'll get special rewards in heaven beyond just the inheritance of the saints. So I'm going to say both. I don't know. I, I think maybe both. That's where my mind's going here on this thing. I think we're talking about heavenly rewards and earthly rewards. But I can't be very specific because I don't know. Here's what I do know. You might want to write this down. God gives good gifts. I believe that. I think that's true. The Bible says uh, in James chapter 1, every good and perfect gift is from above. Well, that settles it right there, right? Matthew chapter 7, this same sermon, Jesus is going to say just a few breaths later, uh, if, if then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good things to those who ask him? God gives good gifts. And here's something else that God does. God gives better gifts than the applause of men. So when you accept the applause of men for your righteous acts, you are shortchanging yourself. 
You're stealing from yourself a blessing that God could be giving you that you don't even realize. Word of caution, though. Oftentimes, you talk about the reward of God, how God rewards people. People tend to, or a lot of people will, glorify the reward of God or the gift of God over God himself. The goal in our hearts and our lives shouldn't be to give so that God will reward us. That's just a blessing. We should give. We should serve. We should practice these righteous acts. Why? Because God has already given. I don't know about you, but I'm already blessed. You know, my, my sins have been pardoned by the blood of Jesus. I have the Holy Spirit of God living in me. I'm already blessed. I'm never alone. I have an advocate before the Father making intercession on my behalf. I'm already blessed. On my worst day, I'm already blessed. You know what I mean? On my worst day, I know that when this life is over, I'm going to step into the presence of God forever. I'm already blessed. God's already given me a lot of rewards for nothing, for nothing. And that's the thing, you know, Christians are generous. Why? Because God is generous. Why should Christians be generous? Why should Christians give with true motives? Because God has already acted that way. That, that, that first verse you ever memorized, if you ever memorized any verse, says that for God so loved the world that he gave. He gave. God is generous. His one and only son. So whoever believed in him would not perish in hell forever, but instead have everlasting life, have eternal life in heaven with God forever. We are generous because God is generous. When you understand what God has given you in Christ, his son, what he was willing to do to pay for your sins, a debt you could never pay, then you in turn should be generous as well. God so loved the world that he gave his son. Have you ever received that gift that God has given? I mean, he's put that gift out there. He's been generous enough to give his son to pay for your sins. I wonder if you've ever received that gift. You know, I mentioned at the very beginning, these righteous acts. What are your right? What are the things in your life that you do just because of what Christ has done in your heart? And if you're having trouble coming up with these things, I think it's a fair assessment to say that maybe, maybe that work hasn't been done in your heart. Maybe you haven't received that free gift of salvation that God offers you. You're not generous because you don't understand the generosity of God in Christ Jesus, his son. Has there been a moment or a time in your life when you received the generosity of God the pardon for your sins, the blessing of the Holy Spirit, the promise of eternal life in heaven. Has there been a moment, a time? When was it? Are you different now than you were at that moment because of what Christ is doing in your life? Have you had a moment? Has that time come? We call that moment getting saved, getting right with God, whatever. The truth is when we just pray and ask Jesus to come into our heart and forgive our sins and begin to to walk for him, live our life for him. No longer living for the applause of men, but living for the applause of heaven. Have you begun that journey of faith with God? If not, why not do that right now? I'm going to give you a moment. We're going to have a time of prayer where we bow our heads and we close our eyes. Go ahead and do that. Just bow your head and close your eyes for a moment. Just a time of prayer. And I just want to, I want to ask you that question again. Have you given your heart and your life to Jesus? Have you received what he has given you in his son Jesus? If not, why not do it right now? If that's you and you need to be saved, you need to get right with God today, do it right now. Don't wait till next Sunday. You may not make it to next Sunday. We don't know. Do it right now because you don't know. Just between you and God, pray. You don't got to have all the right words. What matters is your heart. That's the whole point. But pray and ask him to come in your heart and forgive your sins once and for all.